Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. How's it going, everyone? Hopefully it's good. It is a Monday. Uh, rays of emojis. Did anyone watch the eclipse today? Anyone? I know Rebecca did. We got some confettis. That's great. I forgot that it happened until it was all over the news, and I was like, oh, darn it. Missed out, but that's okay. I saw the last one. Pat Harris says, I am a Boilermaker grad. Huzzah. On TV from Argentina, Barbara. Amazing. Amazing. All right, everyone. Well, welcome to this prototyping wireframes session. Um, if you are in the Slack channel, you would have seen the icebreaker of Do You Have a Pet? Um, so my dog, Echo, also wants to say welcome to you all. My pup is the cutest of them all. So he says hello. All right. And let's go ahead and introduce your clicked coach. We've got Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, is that number still accurate? 16. I know people get certs and then we don't. Yeah. Have no, I've been chilling. I've been chilling at 16 for a while now. I've been debating Perfect. going back to the certification trail, but I have not yet caved. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an idea of uh, what next cert you would want if you did decide to go out of the cave? I don't know. I saw that AI associate thing and I was like, hmm, interesting, interesting. I know there's been a lot of buzz around AI with Salesforce lately. Um, so kind of interested in that. Probably get you could, you could pass that one. It's it's very easy. Then we can change it to 17 for you. I know, right? I want to get education at some point because I like uh, I like working with higher ed. They never have they never. Oh, well, no, I shouldn't say never. But a lot of times uh, I don't know that I would want to consult with higher ed fully because I know money is always kind of tight in higher ed. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But it's a lot of fun to dabble in if you don't need to get paid. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Good to know, everyone. In retirement, that is the time for you to go into higher ed cloud and Absolutely. other things too. I agree, Wendy. I like getting paid, so that I wouldn't know. be. Yep, yeah, that wouldn't be for me. Um, all right. Well, Rebecca. Yeah, that's a great question. Pat asks, "What is the best one that you liked? What's the best certification that you liked?" Okay, so I, I'm super biased. I started in um, Einstein, like uh, reporting and analytics. It was really hard for me at the time, but it was a good one. Um, I liked CPQ in that I thought it was really interesting. Um, Omni Studio is one that I passed, but I really want to circle back and like dig into it further because I studied it, but I don't feel like I applied it as much as I wanted to to like fully get it. I know a lot of people try to get all the experience and then do the cert and then, you know, prove or apply what they've done. I kind of do it a little bit backwards, which I know is sometimes controversial, but a lot of times I will book study to get the cert to kind of prove to myself that I know it enough to actually go do it. And then I go do it and apply it a lot. And then I would probably get a much better score on the cert later. But you know what? <laughs> this is just how I do things. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is Rebecca's lo-fi method that has worked for her. Speaking of which, lo-fi and wireframes, that is what we are um, all about today. So let's dive into that. Um, welcoming Rebecca as our coach today. The first thing we're going to do is a little overview prompt, setting the stage, setting the space of what to expect in this next 55 or so minutes together, and then we will talk about wireframes. What are they? What are they not? Answer a couple of questions, whatever comes to mind, and then live feedback. This is the exciting part where you get to come up on stage and show what it is that you created. We'll talk a little bit about um, what we would like to be seeing and different ways that you can approach this challenge, what sorts of things you can show on stage. And then, of course, we'll do some Q&A and discussion. Uh, the live feedback is really the greatest part because you get to learn by watching others and you get to learn by getting feedback. 
Here at Clicked, we learn from each other. What we do here at Clicked is actually called a reverse classroom model, which means that we don't teach you, but you show us what you made and we learn by working through challenges together. And it's different every single time. You can't predict it, you can't script it, and you definitely can't make it the same as the last time. And it is a safe space to try, 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 try. There's no grades, there's no doing it right. So volunteer, participate. We've got 30 amazing humans in this session. Would love to hear from each and every one of your brains what it is that you're, um, what you're learning, what you're thinking, and et cetera. Yes, Michelle, flipped classroom, reverse classroom, exactly. And then, of course, have fun. Everyone says it, but this is an improv session. I don't come to these sessions with prepared questions. Um, I don't know if Rebecca comes with a prepared spiel about what wireframes are, but uh, we will create this together as we go along, and it's always tons of fun. How do I interact in this session? How can I jump in on the learning and the fun? Well, first and foremost is to raise your hand, and get live feedback, or work through the challenge. If you have read the interview notes and looked at those KPIs that Devine Grohl had um, laid out in her interview and you think you know what a dashboard might be and you kind of dabbled on it, but you get stuck. You can also come on stage and debug with us. Wireframing is low fi which means very, very, very lean. And so if you do get stuck, Getting stuck in this beginning stage is a great place to get stuck because it means you haven't uh, built out a whole entire dashboard yet. All right. You can also interact in the session by using the chat. I see lots and lots and lots of people interacting in the chat, which is amazing. You can ask a question live if you want to have more of a collaborative discussion or you know some of you might have 50 questions and want to have more of an in-depth discussion also you can come up on stage or if you just are tired of my questions and you have one of your own that's also an option and of course there is the q a box which you'll find directly below the chat sidebar mm, yep Sidebar, uh, just two little bubbles that say Q&A. If you hover over them, you can ask a question in there, and that allows me to bring your question up on the big screen. All right, let's get started. Introducing the scenario and the task. You have been hired to come in as a business analyst working for Arizona State University. Up until this point, ASU has used forms and Google Sheets to manage course enrollment. They recently hired your team to adjust their system to begin using Salesforce to manage course enrollment as there's been an increase in demand for expanded course offerings. You will be working with Devine Grohl, Director of Analytics, to complete this project. And of course, I have just shared those interview notes with you in the chat so you can go back to them for easy reference. Here is the task. Develop a low fidelity wireframe for a dashboard requested by your stakeholder for the scenario in the proposed interview, provided interview. The wireframe can be used using a tool of your choice, including colored pencils, post-it notes, or other online tools, as long as the focus is on the placement and the structure of the components. Start by identifying the key data and metrics that need to be displayed on the dashboard, such as open service requests, average resolution time, customer satisfaction ratings are examples of metrics. Adapt that per the interview notes. Next, sketch out the layout and the structure of the dashboard. Placement of different components. It should be clear from the wireframe how users can interact with the dashboard and access detailed information or do things related to stakeholder requests. Again, you do not need a Salesforce org to build a wireframe. In fact, if you're trying to build a wireframe, please don't do it in a Salesforce org because then it's probably not a wireframe. Remember, we're building something low fidelity so we can validate the design with the stakeholder before moving to the next stage. You'll know when you're done, when you have crowned that low fidelity wireframe that organizes key data metrics. Raise your hand, present it in session. All right, with that refresh, the time has come. If you are new to AirMeet and you would like to share your work, there is a button that says raise your hand. It is in the lower right 
hand corner of the screen. You can do that now so that you can share your work, get feedback and learn together. Raise your hand, get in the queue. And while we wait for people to raise their hands, let's do a quick coach discussion on the topic wireframes. What comes to mind when I say that word, Rebecca? Yeah, so for me, wireframing was always important, particularly um, in analytics and particularly in the low fidelity stage, because we really want to give a visualization to get some idea of the basics of what we're talking about and what we think might be helpful. The point, as with many of these exercises, is to have a good conversation with your stakeholder and make sure that you guys are both on the same page. Um, so for me, that's really what my focus is with low fidelity mockups. I do prefer low fidelity as we're getting started because I really don't want people getting stuck on things that I don't really care about yet, like colors or, um, you know, the really nitty gritty details. I really am just looking to make sure that we have a strong baseline um, so that we know what data we need and what our priorities are, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, definitely makes sense. And so you mentioned, you know, wanting to start low fidelity. Can you go more in depth as to what that means? Yeah, so low fidelity basically just means that it's going to be really basic. Um, it's not going to have a lot of detail. Typically, they're going to be sort of black and white drawings. They're not, they're not great. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. They're not supposed to be really fancy. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. We're really, truly focused on the absolute minimum of what is important to the client um, and what information they need to see for this to be successful. Okay, beautiful. Black and white stick figures, if you will, except yeah. dashboards. Rohan asks, uh, do you prefer hand-drawn wireframes or digital versions? Yeah, I usually do digital versions, um, but honestly, for me personally, a lot of times I start with uh, hand-drawn versions. So like for me personally and my notes, I will mock it up, like just drawing it with pencil before I go in the computer sometimes because I just, my brain works and processes more creatively, I think, when I physically draw mm -hmm. it. Um, but by the time I show it to a customer, typically I am working on some kind of an electronic version. The reason I do that is because as we're having the conversation, I like to be able to edit it live. And that's really hard to do with a hand-drawn version, but it's really easy to do um, with an electronic version. And then I can save it uh, and version it as I need as well, which is really helpful if they decide that they want to revert back to something that we had previously. What I will caution you against you can absolutely send your stakeholder PDFs, but <laughs> typically when I am looking at these, I do want to be able to edit live. So I, I tend to shy away from um, flat files, if that makes sense. Flat files, meaning things like PDF slash not able to be edited live. Is that what you mean? Right, right. So typically when I'm presenting, um, you know, sometimes maybe I'll present a static file, but for the most part, I usually try to present out of the live version as much as I can, um, just so that I'm able to really make those changes. It does mean though that you need to kind of coordinate with your team and make sure that your pencil's down long before you actually have your presentation time. <laughs> Not fun to have unexpected changes. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> we always have lots of questions about tools and of course we know it depends and lots of contingencies etc but for the purpose of wireframes once you've got that you know black and white picture drawn out is there one that you would recommend for people that are new to these tools to, to jump into yeah i have really liked balsamic i've used a few of them but Honestly, I think Balsamic was fine for my use. There's also like Miro and um, I'm sure there's stuff in there uh, in Lucid Charts for it as well. I've had really good luck with Lucid Charts as well. I haven't used Miro as much, um, but I got started on Balsamic and I thought that was really helpful. Yep, and those are the ones that we recommend um, in the LMS as well is Balsamic and 
UIs are. And I know a lot of people have really enjoyed that one, but you know, if you know a tool and you're comfy with it, that's great. If not, just choose one, dive in, start with what something, you know, you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Grant says, I thought of salad. Yes, I agree. And yeah. that is why I also like balsamic because it makes me feel happy when I log in. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Wendy says, Rebecca likes to give the stakeholder what they want right then and there. We've got Miro, Lucid, Elements. I would not try to create a wireframe in Elements. It is not made for that. Um, let's see, Figma. Yeah, Figma is a little bit more of, of the advanced. Y'all know what's up. Okay, awesome. Well, what we would like to do now, everyone, is go into presentations and see those wireframes. Currently, there is nobody in the queue. So if you would like to raise your hand slash, if you would like to see someone else raise their hand, be brave, be the first one to come up on stage. And until then, let's go through the task. So I've got these interview notes and I'm gonna post um, a couple of those KPIs over here in the chat so we can go through things. The first one, it did not copy very well. Hold, please, everyone. <laughs> Just FYI, I have lost the tab that you guys are on. So if I accidentally exit, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. And I'm I'll trying just, to find it. <laughs> I'll just keep talking and try to finish your sentence. Not a problem. We got this. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So a couple of KPIs that we found in the interview notes, enrollment and revenue. Primary measures of success are the number of enrollments and revenue generated from online courses, looking to improve the visibility of enrollment trends and course demands for better strategic planning. Okay, so we've got that listed as a KPI. Can you walk me through next steps for how would I go translating those requested metrics into something visual? Yeah, so I think your first decision point really is, well, the very first one is probably what you want to start with um, and what you want to prioritize. So if you heard about, you know, enrollment nine times, you heard about something else three times, you're probably going to start with enrollment and go from there. Um, again, I try to prioritize things based on either frequency or impact or both. Um, Really, it's usually both, but I think you'll find that one typically wins out. Impact to me is like lowest hanging fruit or what is going to really move the needle forward fast. So for instance, if I heard about enrollment nine times, but I'm also hearing that we have visualizations regarding enrollment that are like 80 to 90% of what we need. Um, maybe I heard about uh, retention five times, but I was hearing that it's absolutely critical need for the business. They're really struggling with it. It's costing them a lot of money to not have this visibility and they have nothing right now. Um, even though they have the right data to do it, they just have no visualizations and it's terrible, right? Um, in that case, I might choose to start with retention over enrollment first because I'm hearing that retention is going to make a huge difference for your business out of the gate. It's relatively low hanging fruit. It's kind of equally approachable, um, but it's going to really like bang in your face, change things very fast. Whereas the enrollment, yes, you need it, um, but you already have a lot of what you need right now. So you're not going to get that same level of like really high impact um, in the time frame that we have. So that's kind of my thought there is if you can... Obviously, it's nice when the two are the same, <laughs> but if the two aren't the same, then you're going to want to decide, you know, if you want to go for frequency or impact or if there's even a high impact opportunity for you. Um, if you do have a high impact opportunity, the next step, if I had decided on that sort of route, um, is to really think through what basic visualization I think is going to be helpful here, um, which is typically chart type, right? So bar chart, mind graph, pie chart, whatever the case may be, I want to choose a type of visualization that makes sense based on what I'm talking about. If, for instance, I'm trying to chart something over time, 
typically I'm going to think about maybe a line chart of some kind. I might even think about um, like using the colored uh, fill under the line just to really make it stand out. If I'm talking about percentages, maybe I'm looking at a pie chart. If I'm talking about uh, comparative numbers, but not necessarily percentages, then maybe I'm starting to think about bar charts um, and maybe even stacked bar, things like that. Sometimes I'll use funnel too, uh, but those are funnel. I feel like it's is so specific to a funnel use case. <laughs> so typically funnel is pretty straightforward. If it's a funnel, you use a funnel. If it's not a funnel, don't use a funnel. Yeah. Yeah. There may or may not be any funnels in here, but what I'm seeing is unless we want to be recruiting slash unenrolling students as quickly as possible. <laughs> And the bottom of the funnel is the closer they get to unenrolled. Yeah, maybe not, but we could be wrong. Rohan says, haven't seen Noodle used to describe curved line charts. No, I was just I was just being dumb. I'm not sure there is such thing as a Noodle chart, but you know, there's donut and pie, so why not? All right, cool. So everyone, you've got a couple important things to think through. The urgency, how many times something is listed, and also there are some quotes in those notes from the stakeholder. So consider those things as we go along. And we've got our first presenter who I'm gonna bring up to the stage. Can everyone please give a warm, warm emoji filled welcome to Chinasa. Hello, how's it going? Hi, I'm fine. Good evening. Excellent. In Nigeria. Good evening. Let's so go I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, you're going to push the square O button and then choose the tab or the window that you'd like to share. Yeah, Rohan, it's not real. It is just a note card, but the other side, it is merch. It says it depends. So, you know, we, we, we figured things out. <laughs> Sorry, I want to confirm if my screen is up. No, not yet. You can't see it yet. Are you trying? Wait, oh, maybe. it's coming. There yeah. we go. Now it's up. Okay. Um, when I was doing this, I tried to use pen and pencil, but along the line, um, I decided to do some prompts to get some data visualization because we are talking about metrics and data here, how to enroll students in the schools and the actionable insights. So, um, I basically do prompt here using Uzad and it took me to, this is actually my landing page and I'm so sorry, uh, there is no flow automation here. This is basically workflow because um, this is basically um, just a rough wireframe because I was limited to some assets because I'm using a free version, so pardon me for that. So there, here and I was able to- a, what, it, what tool are you using? I use Uzad. Uzad, okay, cool. Yes. So I was able to come up with the the, the, the actual metrics ranging from the marketing department, the inside the report they are gonna get from the success track from students. And I focus mainly on the visibility of knowing the number of students being enrolled per the per course that's basically on the online cap uh, class capacity. I use, I, I just visualize some data, I put some data to be able to come up with a real-time data uh, analysis, um, sorry, to be able to come up with a real-time visualization. So to be able to know, because I'm just trying to freelance and walk through this and I had to come up with some numbers to use it to visualize this and be able to see how it works uh, in wireframe. Cause actually this is my first time of using the wireframe and this is my first time of actually doing something in the wireframe. So going to this place, you see where the enrollment reports, at the beginning it has a flow optimization. I think maybe some, some, some words, uh, some items will be clickable to take you to some parts where you need 
to work on and it not just going round and round the the wire frames and stuff like that and i was able to come up with this and that i don't know maybe i'm just talking jargons or maybe going through a lot i don't know i just need think i just come up with something and need some basic corrections and that yeah, so let's talk about this one here this enrollment reports um so i think that most people who are on this call probably resonate pretty well with what we're looking at because it's pretty in line with the KPIs and the reporting aspects, the analytics aspects of the interview notes that you saw. So awesome. Good start there. Um, in the top left, so I'm going to, this is nitpicky, just forewarning. In the top left, you have enrollment um, as like a, like a subheading, like it would be on a side menu. Yes. And the key is cut off. I know that it's cut off for space because I have played this game before. But <laughs> <laughs> just as an example, this is the type of thing that is going to trip up stakeholders. Why? Okay. I could not tell you. But, but like misspellings, top of the list for things that like just completely derail your wireframe conversations oh. for <laughs> reason. Um, Okay, so that's good. And then I see courses, I see metrics, success tracker grades, cool, some interesting stuff, pass averages. So it looks like we're talking about some of the things that I could maybe slice and dice by, which is interesting. Um, I would probably change. So you have this kind of logged in, quote unquote, your user down here is a student. That's probably not going to be the case. Typically, this is going to be, you know, somebody who's in administrative management. Um, so I would okay. probably shift that so that the persona is clear so that the users kind of know who would be looking at this report based on what they're seeing for a logged in individual in the frame. You don't have to include who's logged in here, but if you're going to, just know that anything you include in these is up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, yeah so then moving on to the actual dashboard section enrollment reports enrollment trends that's interesting oh wait go back <laughs> go back yeah okay. the, the same one we were on before i was yeah okay. i just mean going into the the center right section here yeah um, so enrollment trends, tracking student enrollment metrics over time, cool, all students, total enrollment. Okay, yeah, I would, so typically, I like your success tracker, the 9.2 success rate. I don't actually know what that means, so you'd want to be able to talk to it well. Um, I'm assuming your audience knows what it means, so fair enough. Um I would maybe consider making that a percentage if a percentage is relevant there. Based on how it's named, I think maybe it is. But I like that you have really quick, like big numbers, something important to them at the top of the page. Uh, typically, mm -hmm. folks read in an F pattern, which means you want to go to the right at the top of the page and then down the left side of the page is typically where you're going to see the most attention. So we try to kind of reflect that in our dashboards. So typically, I would actually recommend um, you can have this bar chart next to the success tracker big number if you want. But oftentimes, one of the more popular formats that I've seen for dashboarding is to do the big numbers kind of one by one across the top of the page. So you would have maybe maybe five of the big numbers um, with five metrics that are just flat numbers, but they're really important to the group. And then under that, you would have your bar chart. And then under that, you would have either additional supporting reports, uh, additional supporting visualizations, or as much as it pains me to see it, oftentimes on dashboards, for whatever reason, folks will request a table view of some of the data that is in the dashboard. 
I don't like putting tables in dashboards, but it happens more often than not. So if we're being realistic, it'll probably be in there somewhere, at least on a few of your dashboards. Um, that's kind of fine. It's not, it's not a visualization really. So that's why I'm like, ugh, boo. But it is highly requested. People use it a lot. So fair enough. Um, but as we're kind of talking through that, I think you can also kind of see that we're sort of going from the least granular to the most granular. Most, right? Yeah. So have those like flat number, no detail, just like boom. <laughs> Here's a quick check. Here's some important information. Is it good? Is it bad? Do you need to ask extra questions? Let's find out. All and right. then the next layer down, we see some real visualizations. We're seeing like a little bit more detail. We're seeing line graphs. We're seeing bar charts. We're seeing pie graphs, whatever it is. And usually we still want to have kind of like more important central ones that are going to be larger. They're going to be more centered, whatever the case may be. Um, if you can't have it centered, then left is usually preferable to right, again, just because of the reading pattern. And then you may have um, some supporting information on the right, right? So like I might have, just as an example, I might have a really large stacked bar. And then I have some supporting information represented in pie graphs on the right side. And maybe I stack two or three of them. They're much, much smaller, but they are there. Um, and they are specifically providing related or supporting information. But we all know my massive stacked bar is the star of the show. In this case, your bar chart would be the star of the show. Um, yeah, and then as, yeah, as you get further down the page, you get more granular if you need to. I would say um, try not to, like, put a ton of information on your dashboards. This is this is probably a good density of information. Um, I I have a tendency to overload dashboards because I'm one of those horrendous people that consultants like me have nightmares about, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, you really don't want to be trying to cram every answer to every question on a dashboard. You want the dashboard to answer one question. All right. So it's hard to refine to that point. Um, but ultimately, I would say that was your goal. With this, for instance, you're talking about graded score analysis, enrollment trends, student advice, student social, student communication, and marketing. That could all be related to a central question about enrollment. Um, but you may also decide that you want to like split it out into multiple questions that each have their own dashboard. Yeah. I think that's about all of my advice on this one. It looks good though. I really, I like it. It is a little bit higher fidelity than I was expecting, full transparency, but it's not crazy. I still feel like it's pretty reasonable. You really only have like two or three colors in here and I think that's fine. Also, none of the colors are like super, super bright, which I think is helpful. If you are going to go away from the grayscale, but you're supposed to be heading for low fidelity, I would say keep your color pattern incredibly neutral, incredibly similar. You can use like maybe one color for contrast, but it really needs to be kind of a pastel or grayish color like this one. Um, and even that, the risk that you run is that you're going to get into this conversation and you're going to say, hey, I want feedback about if these are the right metrics for you. And you yeah. walk in and the head of marketing says, oh, I hate this dashboard. This is awful. And you're like, oh, oh, geez, why did I did I mishear what's important to you? And she's like, have you seen that green? That's horrendous. I hate it. It's got to go. This is awful. Um, <laughs> and the problem with that is that it's really not the feedback we're looking for. It's kind of yeah. And it takes time. And you only have so much time with these stakeholders. Um, and there's also going to be folks in the room who are like, oh, bar chart there. I hate bar charts. Gross. Why do we have bar charts? And somebody else is going to be like, what's up with this title on the bar chart? Total pass. Uh, what is that? I don't know what that means. Why is that there? And so, you know, everybody has their own questions and concerns. And yeah. a lot of them are a little bit niche and maybe not super central to the question of whether or not you are asking the right questions and have the right metrics or information. So as many of those side conversations as you can 
quash and not encourage. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do with low fidelity. That's why I say like no colors as much as possible. Keep it really simple because every mm -hmm. additional bell that you add, every additional level of polish that you add is actually an additional opportunity for somebody to ask questions that you don't yes. care about yet. True. <laughs> so, yeah, but this looks good. You did a great job. It's really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chinasa, for sharing your work. Uh, yeah, I like that idea. Don't give them a reason to complain. <laughs> Just keep it really simple and low fidelity. So let's uh, let's kind of go through what we had going on in the chat throughout that conversation. You had talked a little bit about the stacked bar charts. Rebecca, can you go into like, I guess, use cases for stacked versus non-stacked bar charts? Yeah, fair enough. Um, so stacked is typically used when you have two metrics that are important to you. They're both categorizations and one category categorization is within the other. Um, so for instance, I could use a stacked bar when I was talking about lead source by product category. So I could stack in either direction. I could say my bars are going to be web, trade show, organic, and then the stacking is going to be, uh, well, the product categories. So like uh, cups, plates, bowls. Basically, the objective is to tell me of my web leads, how many of the web leads are coming in for which product category. So what it ultimately gets you to is are certain sources attracting customers for specific product categories? And if that's the case, do I want to change my investment into those product or change my investment into the uh, marketing sources, lead sources, in order to hopefully attract a different um, number of leads for each product category? So better example there, let's say that I spend... 50% of my marketing budget on web leads and then 25 on organic and 25 organic doesn't make sense, but ignore it. 25 on trade shows. I might find that hundred percent of the web leads coming in are coming in for bowls. 50% of organic are coming in for bowls. 20% of uh, trade shows are coming in for bowls. So if I want to rapidly increase the number of leads or sales I'm getting for bowls, then I might look at that and say, yeah, we're going to dump a ton of money into web leads because that's what's giving us the most leads for bowls. The percentages are huge. The conversions are great. Let's do it. However, <laughs> if I say I actually have too many orders coming in for bowls, I can't fill them all or for whatever reason they're not converting or whatever the case may be. Anyway, I don't want more bowls. I don't need bowls. We're good on bowls. Thanks. <laughs> I'm only looking for people who are interested in plates. If I need somebody who's interested in plates and I'm only getting bowls from web leads, even if I'm getting thousands more leads from web leads than from trade shows, it doesn't matter. Because even if I'm getting thousands of leads, I'm only getting bowls. So if I need plates, dumping more money into web leads isn't going to do it for me if I keep the same strategy. So either I use web leads and I think the audience for plates is there, but I have skewed my marketing for web and I can try a new marketing strategy and maybe that'll do it. Or I say, okay, I can't put money in web leads because I'm only going to get bowls and I need plates. So now I've got to look at the other two and decide where am I getting more plates there? What's my cost per lead? What's my conversion rate? Which of those two am I going to dump money in if I'm really ultimately looking only for plates? I know that was kind of a, a weird example, but that is a very realistic way that we use analytics is to kind mm -hmm. of figure out what we need to do in order to target certain segments of our audience or in order to shift what we're seeing um, in terms of sales. Okay. 
So stacked bar is a juicy visual. That's the takeaway from that one. And follow on to that, uh, how is that different from a grouped bar chart? Slash, like, first of all, how do those look different? And then the, the differences. Yeah, so in theory, they could be kind of similar. Essentially stacked bar, you're gonna see one central bar chart for the category. So if I have web, web organic trade show, you're gonna see three bars one for each. Um, and then within that singular bar chart under web, you're going to see a different color for each of the subcategories, each of the other categories. So you're going to see, you know, red for bowls, blue for plates, green for cups. And so it's all going to be part of one bar, but that's the colors are going to differentiate um, the percentage or the number within that actual large bar. Uh, the way it works for grouped bars is that you would actually see three bars for web. You would see one for plates, one for bowls, and one for cups. And the reason that there's kind of a, a pretty big difference, in my opinion, between them is that it's kind of a different vibe, if you will. Um, if you're really looking at kind of a percentage then I think it's really helpful to use stacked because stacked is essentially giving you a bar-shaped pie graph where you can say, this is the amount of area out of the whole that is represented by this category, this thing. Um, whereas if you do it grouped, there's not this concept of what the whole is. So yes, you can see the comparison between those three subcategories more easily, um, but you're losing that sense that this is like a percentage of a whole. So if you are just looking at a number, you don't care about percentage, um, and you want to compare the three really easily across the top, then sure, that's very effective. Um, if you're looking for the kind of percentage concept, then I would lean towards stacked rather than grouped. Huzzah. All right. Thank you for that question, Rohan. Hopefully that answered it. Everyone, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left that we can have for presentation. So now is the time. I'm going to go into the Q&A in the meantime, um, while we wait for another one of you brave learners to come up on stage. Wendy in the Q&A asks, are these presented generally to the stakeholder or the technical team? Oh, these are stakeholders, hardcore stakeholder. <laughs> um, so the technical team is potentially going to do these mock-ups, although honestly, I would say I typically would prefer for like a BA essentially to do the mock-up and then kind of coordinate with the technical team about it to make sure that the mock-up is relatively feasible. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not like going to get sign off on something that is definitely not going to happen. <laughs> But I prefer to have the BA take a swing at it first because at least in my perspective, the BA tends to be more functional and I really lean on the BA to understand how the stakeholder is thinking even more than what the stakeholder is saying. So anybody on the team knows what the stakeholder is saying, um, but not everybody has the same insight to the weight behind each thing or maybe the hidden undercurrents or the overall goals of the project or not even the project. Sometimes it's like the goals in general of the organization. Um, arguably PMs have good insight there, but it tends to be more at the admin level, kind of the people who sign the checks level. Um, and usually for analytics, I'm particularly interested in the boots on the ground perspective, which the BA tends to have the best access to. Um, so for those reasons, typically I would like for the BA to at least start on or heavily participate in the wireframing conversation um, with insight and, and uh, coordination of the technical team. And then when we present it, we're gonna present it mostly to stakeholders. Honestly, usually there's not a huge technical team that you're working with on the customer side. Um, if there is a technical team, a lot of times you are 
part of the technical team, technically. <laughs> uh, so you would ultimately present it to both potentially, but you would present it to the technical team first for review and more or less sign off. You know, they're going to look at it and say, yeah, this is doable. Yeah, do we have the capability? Do we have the right information? Do we have the right data? Can we do this? Um, and if they say, yeah, this doesn't look egregiously wrong in some area, then they're going to go ahead and move it on to the stakeholder presentation. If not, we may need to adjust and then it will go to stakeholders. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Next question comes from Anka, newcomers to wireframing. Uh, give us some recommendations for training resources, tutorials, and community forums to enhance our skills that are best practices. And then in the comment section asks, what are best practices? Yeah, that's a lot of good questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I have like specific resources. Um, there is a, I believe it's UX trail uh, for Salesforce. So that could be a good place to start if you're heavily in the Salesforce ecosystem. I know Balsamic's pretty into wireframing, so I would not be surprised at all if they had some tutorials and things that were out there. I would say just check out YouTube videos, honestly. Um, look at some people building wireframes. Look for examples of wireframes. One thing to be really aware of as you do that is the difference between low fidelity, medium fidelity, and high fidelity. Um, low fidelity, we've talked about already, not going to be very detailed, not a lot of colors. You're really focused on the information and maybe the order that information is pre presented in, maybe the type of chart and things like that. Um, but you're not going to be looking at, at like colors and details and fonts and, you know, things like that. Um, when you get to medium fidelity, you're starting to add things. So maybe you're adding a color palette, maybe you're adding more realistic word choice. Maybe you're adding, you know, whatever details to enhance and, and make it more interesting. Or you may be enhancing it by um, adding like mimicked faceting behavior, things like that. Um, when you get to high fidelity, it pretty much looks like what it would look like in Salesforce. <laughs> Sometimes for high fidelity, I honestly just do it in Salesforce with dummy data. Um, and it might not be fully built out. Maybe it doesn't facet correctly. Maybe, you know, some of the crazy stuff isn't there to massage the data to be what it needs to be for the real dashboard. But it looks the way it would normally look. That does not mean it's fully built. Does not mean it fully works. It just means that it looks <laughs> like what it would look like um, as a finished product. That typically is high fidelity. Um, yeah, so just be aware of that. If you start seeing uh, wireframes that look really, really polished, really, really nice, and you're like, man, why are mine in black and white? Why am I being told to do that? Whereas these are like really amazing, just know that those are probably high fidelity wireframes. If you are asked to do high fidelity, that's great. If you're asked to do low fidelity, there's a reason and high fidelity will not work in its place nine times out of 10. Yep. Yeah, it, it takes me back to the my all time favorite wireframe in one of these sessions. I don't remember Jamie, Jenna, but came in in the middle of the session and was like, I'm so sorry, but like I got really inspired and I used my kids colored pencils to like do a wireframe. And so she held it up to the camera and then, yeah, like like Pat had said, uh, well, she says people got distracted by color, but in this case, like it was it was tastefully used, right? Just colored pencils and the the dashboard. It was so lo-fi and it was like, OK, cool. I can tell that you thought through what it was and also like, hey, does this work? If so, we'll move it to the next stage. If not, it's totally fine. It's an it's an MVP dashboard, if you will. Um, so to that point, it's like low fidelity. We love fancy. We like to look nice, but not, not, not here. Awesome question, Anka. Thank you for that. Uh, we had another one regarding any other small details like spelling that irks stakeholders in your experience, like uh, lime green or neon color combos. Yeah. Yeah. So um, distracting color combos is like number one super easy off the top colors that people don't like i've had people oh, dude, this was so embarrassing but um it feels like it shouldn't be a big deal but there was a client for which i had a ba 
who did not understand the the color palette discretion necessary and they accidentally used the the color palette of like their main compelli- competitor it was not on purpose it was totally an accident um but they accidentally used the color palette of their main competitor and it was it was a thing like it was a big thing <laughs> Um, spelling 100% is like the most (laughs) tricky spacing spacing gets hit really fast like not leaving enough um, space for words not leaving enough white space having things overlap having the spacing not be even oh people like get that so fast Um, oh yeah words being like uneven So, like, if you are manually placing your charts, if those lines don't line up precisely, oh, people see it so fast and they will comment on it. And you'll be like, yeah, this actually isn't going to be an issue when we get into Salesforce. And they're like, are you are you sure? Because, I mean, it looks terrible. (laughs) Are you sure the sizing is all right? Because I don't know. I'm just getting a weird vibe about the sizing. That's the worst, too, is when you know that they complained that things weren't in line and you told them, oh, don't worry, it's going to be in line. And so now they're complaining about the sizing and you know that they really mean that they didn't like that it wasn't in line properly. But like now we have this complaint or request that is in here for sizing that we somehow have to address even though the sizing was fine. (laughs) Um. So yeah, definitely just go through it a few times. Um, The other big thing that gets people is realistic data. So you don't necessarily want to use exact data because people will get hung up on that too. Why did you choose this use case, blah, 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 blah. But you want to make sure your data is realistic enough that it doesn't cause hangups. So that's another one that I've seen a lot before where like if you're doing... uh, you're talking about enrollment for example right if you give music a really really tiny bar and then business like a huge bar and those stakeholders are both in the room you're gonna get comments you're gonna get comments from music on like we have fine enrollment thank you i don't know why you think our department just doesn't enroll anybody because like the business i know the business people think they're awesome but like we're doing fine over here (laughs) Um, similarly, be careful if you're doing like by rep, right? If you use actual reps names and then you have some lower than others, that will get you. Uh, if you're talking about departments and things again, and you have some in the negative for a KPI that should be positive, that'll get you. Um, yeah, just be, try to be as neutral as you can. People will take it personally, the data that you use and how the visuals actually look, um, So just try to keep it really neutral, very unobjectionable, not personal, not specific. Amazing. Okay. That was the greatest impression of all time. I mean, I love stakeholder interviews and stuff, but Rebecca, when when we have you do a stakeholder interview, can you please talk in that voice? (laughs) I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Excellent. (laughs) Pat had asked a question a while back. Um, I think... I don't remember what the topic was. Oh, it was as um, Anka was asking questions about best practices. Wouldn't you have to know what the different symbols stand for? Um, I don't know exactly what symbols we're talking about, but yes, if you use symbols or if you use something, um, like if you color code something, you need to specify what the color code means um, and what each of those represent. Side note, you also potentially need to do that in your visualizations themselves. So I always I always encourage the use of legends, but if you're using some other kind of icon, you may need to include helpful hints on what that's actually trying to accomplish. Also, it's really, really important to name your charts well. So yes, it might make sense to you to have, you know, enrollment, quarterly enrollment. But if I'm looking at a stacked bar chart or I'm looking at some complex visualization, I need to know a little bit more about what we're talking about with regard to enrollment (laughs) for me to understand what's happening. Usually I try to keep it pretty simple. Um, Maybe it's like enrollment by month, 
you know, for the previous quarter or something along those lines. But uh, just try to be really descriptive. Try to also have a naming convention so that every visualization or report on the dashboard is named in a way where it's super clear to the stakeholder what it's trying to accomplish because it is named in the same format so they know exactly what it's about. They know what to expect. Gotcha. And a clarifying um, from Pat, sometimes you have some people that know the shapes very well. I guess this is like, what are the right shapes, like the actual best practice ones, and they'll call you out on using what their interpretation is of the, of the wrong one. Yeah, this is true. So like, if you're trying to represent images and stuff, for example, you will have stakeholders to call you out for using uh, the wrong icon for that. Um, I mean, know what icons you're using, know why you're using them. Different people have different opinions. Just make sure that you have researched it enough that you feel confident about what it means. Um, you don't need to go super crazy too. It's easy to uh, not have that problem if you just use fewer things. <laughs> so get really, really good at using and knowing what the key shapes are, what the key tools are. Um, and from there, you can add in other stuff as you have to, but it should be like a good garnish. Use sparingly and, uh, and wisely. Excellent. I like that analogy. A garnish. It is not for eating. It is just for sufficient, nice lookingness. Um, shoot. Oh, my question, my last question that I had was, is, do you find it useful to like frame the conversation with the stakeholder in a specific way when going into a wireframing conversation? Oh, a hundred percent. So super key off the, off the bat is to tell them what fidelity to expect and why that's important. Um, for wireframing conversations in particularly, I would be really specific with what information you're trying to get out of them. Um, so I would often frame it in such a way where I'm like, hey, really excited to show this to you today. Like we discussed previously, it is low fidelity. So we're not really concerned about pictures. We're not looking at fonts. We're not looking at really any of the details. We're just here to make sure that we have the right KPIs, the right information. Everybody understands the question we're asking. We're asking the right question on the dashboard. Um, and maybe, you know, the order of things and the sizing to make sure that it's going to be easy for you guys to very quickly get the most valuable information out of this. Um, definitely, there's a lot of time for details later on. But today, we're just here for the basics, here for the core. That's kind of how I introduce those things. Definitely, you can do a much more eloquent job of that. Uh, but the moral of the story is definitely make sure they know what fidelity it is, what to expect, and why that is, because there is a reason you're doing it. Yeah, that is a really good golden nugget right there. And everyone, you now have a script for the rest of your life for how to have conversations about wireframes. So you don't need to worry about making it too fancy because you're telling them, please, it's not supposed to be fancy. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Sharosa, how much time do I have to complete the deliverables? Uh, so typically, and, and we'll, we'll kind of transition into wrapping up for this session. Typically, we like you to complete the deliverables before the session. That way you can come um, prepared and take that feedback, run with it. Um, the feedback form does not expire, but definitely I would say like within a couple days because you're going to forget uh, the, that re learning retention curve or whatever. The, the, the sooner after this session you do it is going to be the best. And then in that same space, everyone, when you go to submit your deliverables with the feedback form, that's where you can upload things and it will be put directly into your dashboard. We did do wireframes for the dashboard for all of you, uh, which is a reason why uh, it looks like it does. Yep, absolutely no problem. I'm signed up at the last minute. Um, Okay, Hilda, I love this question. Um, go ahead and ask it in Slack if there is a feature within Salesforce where you can input descriptions for wireframes. Actually, Rebecca, can, can you speak to this one really quick and, and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, so I was looking it up as we were talking, honestly. Um, I see there is a page in Salesforce Help about lightning experience tips for screen readers. I know that there are 
There's the ability to use screen readers um, in the dashboard builder on that side of things. So I'm sure there is some accessibility. I do believe Salesforce is WCAG as well, which means that they have to have uh, some descriptions, at least for images. So I'm not exactly sure what's there. There is usually also like help text um, and tips and things like that that you can put on. Uh, so there's definitely opportunity to improve how often you are describing what you're looking at, but I'm not exactly sure what the specific uh, screen reader access would look like for the dashboard on the customer side. Huzzah. Sounds like a project to dig into. Thank you, Ilda, for that question. All right, everyone, the time has come for us to wrap up. Uh, we are doing a KPI skills challenge tomorrow. So if you want more on this topic, definitely come prepared, sign up, dive into the LMS, and we would love to see you all there tomorrow. You guys are awesome. Have an amazing Monday, and we'll see you all later. Bye, guys. <laughs>